All right, welcome to the next video, everyone. We're talking now about one of the most iconic beats that I think, Gavin, you're known for, yeah. uh, is uh, The Sound of Muzak. Yeah. Yeah. And really, the, the most underlying secret of it is I didn't really write it. Really? This was something that Steve had programmed on a drum machine. Hmm. And I thought, oh, that's cool. Yeah. I really like that. If I play that, I'll just pretend, uh, I'll take the credit for that. Yeah. <laughs> Steve had programmed something, you know, I mean, it was just a kind of really stiff drum machine part. Mm. And what's very interesting about this particular rhythm is I think of it in seven. It's actually, when you break it down, the bass drum and snare drum are playing seven sixteen. Mm -hmm. uh, One, four, and six. Right. So the bass drum and snare drum pattern are looping in seven sixteen. Right. Okay. And uh, I think I could be wrong. I think originally it had a sort of eighth note thing going on the hi hat. Mm -hmm. So. When I got to jam with it and play along with it, I immediately felt like I wanted to play 7-4 over the top. Now, hmm. the, the subtleties, the ghost notes, the open hi-hats were something that I guess I injected into the original part. Right. So to play it slowly for you, one, I'll count four in, right, one, two, now, I probably added more ghost notes over the years. <laughs> With everything that we played in Porcupine Tree, we found that it evolved, mutated, because you know, when you play it hundreds of times live, yeah. you find little kind of subtleties and things change as they go along. Right. So I felt as the, as the, uh, the progression of the song, you know, we played that song hundreds of times. Mm -hmm. It used to be our favorite second song. Hmm. So whatever tour we did, we normally started with a fast one and the second song always just felt great to do the sound of music. Right. It didn't feel like an opening song. Right. It was too laid back. Right. But it was always a great, ah, oh, yeah. Great breather right. as, a, as a second piece of the set. Yeah. So um, I'll play you a, along with the with the original track, the the rhythm that I came yeah. up with. Yeah. And something I was conscious of when I did it was trying to play it really relaxed hmm. and back on the beat. Mm -hmm. It was never meant to be a sort of, you know, like an mm -hmm. urgent feel. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to play it way back on the beat and have a nice, big, relaxed sound to it. Okay. So even when you're playing odd times, and even when there isn't two and four on the snare drum, you can still play it with the same attitude. Yeah, the right? same as, relaxed. Yeah, as Bernard Purdy might play you know, uh, a Steely Dan song. Yeah, yeah. So, or, or Jeff Picaro might play, you know, a song with someone with a nice relaxed feel, all the ghost notes are laid back, and, and approach what is, uh, you know, a quite progressive odd time signature, but with the attitude of it having, uh, you know, a funky laid back feel. Well, let's hear it. Okay. Yeah.
so I, I can listen to you play that all day. That's great. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to get to the chorus part right. to show you that it goes into 4-4, four, four, mm -hmm. but with that rhythm, dum, gat, gun, gun, dum, da, with that anticipated snare drum on the one E and A. Uh, right. Dum, gat, gun, gun, dum, ba. Right. It, just, it, it felt like a laid back song to me when mm -hmm. I played it. And uh, I remember recording it at Avatar in New York. In fact, I recorded it on the second day I was there. Wow. Well, that's why it became our best ever second song. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. And uh, I don't know, it was a magic day. Mm -hmm. It felt, you know, once in a blue moon with your own playing, you have a, a one-off day where all the planets seem to just line up. Yeah. And you think, wow, everything's feeling great today. No kidding. You know, and then the next day it's gone. Yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't come back. It's like a solar eclipse. Right. It's it comes once, around once, once, once a... you know, every, once in a while. But I can remember that day very clearly. And it was a good day. It was a good day. And I was in a very good frame of mind. You know, yeah. the studio was in the center of Manhattan. Right. And it was a bright, sunny morning. And I walked from the hotel to the studio. And I was just in the right mood. You're in the zone. Yeah. So... Question for you, how, how, how prepared are you before you guys go into the studio? Like when you did the Sound of Music uh, recording on that day, how certain were you with exactly what you were gonna play? Uh, well, I wasn't. I, I mean, I worked at home for about two weeks with the demos. Hmm. And in fact, this was in the days of mini disc. Right. Right. You're right. Yeah. And I remember before I played, before we started recording, I would go in the studio and warm up for half an hour. And then I would listen to my mini disc and just try and remember some of the subtleties and some of the things that I'd played at home that I liked. Mm -hmm. I think, well, may, maybe I can remember to play that kind of fill mm -hmm. or do those ghost notes or something. And that's, uh, that's, I would use it as a reference. Right. I don't know if I ever played it to the band, my, <laughs> my mini disc. <laughs> no kidding. But that was, that was uh, what, 2002. So there's a lot of ebb and flow when you're in the studio, like, let me try this fill out, let me see if that works. And then I guess the guys are in there listening too, or are they yeah. just trusting you? Uh, in that, no, the, the tracks were basically the demos, mm -hmm. and the guys were all in the control room. And that was a song where they just kind of had a big smile on their face, and they said, great. It might have been the first or second take just went down. Other songs, I might have done 10, 12 takes, and we might have said, yeah, you know that bit? What do you think if I did that bit, but I played the China? What if, you know, we had some discussions about changing things, mm -hmm. but uh, that particular one, I think, went down really quick. Yeah, I guess that feeling translated very well into the song because it's, a, it's one, one of your best songs out there. It's that groove, it's iconic now. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing those Pleasure. stories. Yeah, we'll see you guys in the next video. We'll talk about the next song.